Right, hello everybody. Uh, this talk is on OpenGL optimization for OS X. I'm going to skim over quite a lot of OpenGL sort of things because I did the more basic talk this morning. So if you didn't go to that, you may, or if you don't know OpenGL concepts, you may be a bit lost in this talk. Uh, my name is Andrew Bennett. I'm from the University of Tasmania. Uh, I'm doing a computing degree at the university. I'm also doing a mathematics degree, although the computing degree in most ways, although not always, is more relevant to this. Uh, I'm in a society of sorts called the Mac Lab, uh, which is kind of interesting and weird, and you probably see us all about and you don't even know it. Uh, hello? Hello. Uh, I'm undergrad still, although I've been doing OpenGL and all that sort of stuff for quite a while, and so I tend to know what I'm talking about a lot of the time, so if you have any questions, just put up your hand. Um, knowledges. Excellent. Okay, so you want to make the next hip game, like this one. Um, okay, in order to make a game, especially on uh, OS X as opposed to Windows, you're going to want to use uh, OpenGL. In fact, everything that's not Windows, even Windows, you can still use OpenGL. Okay, so introducing OpenGL. All right. Oh, as you may notice, at the bottom of this, of each slide, there's a um, little URL thing. Um, that URL is generally just where I got the graphics from or a reference for where you can find out more about the information. If you can't actually read that, you should be able to find the same information um, or find the links on the slides and you can download them from the AUC probably later on next year when they put them up. Okay. Although well, hopefully before then. If I'm talking too quickly or I'm not enunciating or projecting, uh, just put up your hand and wave, and then I'll either ask if you have a question or you can just shout at me. Okay, 20 questions. I'm sure there aren't actually 20 questions. I wrote that with the um, idea of having 20 questions, and then they kind of became hierarchical and complicated, and then, yeah. So, okay. The first of the 20 questions is, who is OpenGL? And the obvious answer is nobody, because OpenGL isn't really a person. Okay, so what is OpenGL? OpenGL is an open industry standard, which basically means that it's a standard defined by the industry. Um, so the industry has basically said, we need this way to represent three-dimensional things or to talk about graphics cards so that we don't have to make individual drivers and all this really complicated stuff just to talk to our graphics cards. So they made this open industry standard. Okay, and it provides a standardized access to graphics hardware. Okay, so who makes OpenGL? Initially, it was SGI, which is Silicon Graphics International. Um, they made OpenGL, and now OpenGL has been taken over by what's called OpenGL ARB, which is the Architecture Review Board. Um, the OpenGL Architecture Review Board basically administrates OpenGL and uh, allows extensions and other changes to OpenGL to be made in a uniform way and then trialed and then eventually actually combined into the spec. And so if you want to know what's the latest and greatest thing in OpenGL, uh, which is what you'll have to do in order to use quite a lot of the optimizations and some of the things I talk about today, uh, you want to have a look at the OpenGL ARB. Now, semi-recently, this has been taken over by the Kronos Group, which is another layer of abstraction which is basically just this organization that creates web and uh, computing standards. Okay, so why do you care about all of this? Um, basically, the, spec uh, the specification and the API and all the OpenGL stuff made hardware accessible to pretty much all developers. Uh, previously, if you wanted to program for a, spe uh, a specific game or all that sort of stuff, you either had to do it in software because uh, uh, code for software was fairly uniform across platforms, or you actually had to write graphics drivers for your individual card. And so if you had a Voodoo card, which is pretty much what everyone would have, if you actually had a graphics card, although not everyone was so fortunate, then you would have had to actually code all of the stuff to actually talk to the graphics card. And things like OpenGL and DirectX actually abstract all that away, so you don't actually have to think about the low-level stuff. Um, and also, OpenGL delegates uh, the Windows functions, um, so how big your window is. Um, it doesn't actually do events like mouse clicking, although there are some third-party things that do that sort of stuff. But it basically delegates all of the operating uh, system-specific things to the drivers and all of the um, 
graphics card specific things as well. Okay, so yay. Um, if you're interested in doing all this sort of stuff without um, OpenGL, uh, sorry, if you're interested in OpenGL and that sort of stuff for all these old style stuff, uh, OpenGL Doom Legacy is out. Um, have a look at that, it's quite interesting. You can see the, and compare with the old Doom source code and then just kind of see the sort of differences you'd have to do in order to do the low level graphics stuff. Okay, sorry I got distracted, I like Doom. Okay, so OSX does OpenGL for me. Is that what I'm saying? Not quite, um, although I may as well be. Uh, OSX, OSX implements the OpenGL standard. So while it doesn't necessarily do OpenGL for you, it actually allows you to do OpenGL things. Uh, it also provides a lot of extensions implicitly, uh, things like shaders and uh, vertex shaders, geometry shaders, fragment shaders are all supported by um, most uh, modern OSX uh, versions, I think since like 10.4. Um, and also it provides lots of Cocoa extension wrappers, uh, which basically allow you to use OpenGL in an object-oriented way a lot of the time. Although throughout all of this, OpenGL is once again a C API, and so you'll be doing C code, but then you can wrap that within your Objective-C classes. <coughs> okay, so we've got the Kronos group, and you have to remember that um, throughout all of this, that OpenGL is a standard, it's not necessarily an implementation. And so while I can talk about OpenGL, it may actually change depending on the specific implementation. Although a lot of the time, if they're conforming to the spec, then it should perform as expected. Now, because some of the things I'm talking about are OpenGL extensions, uh, you may not necessarily be able to depend on them, although there are certain ways to check that. Okay, so OpenGL on OS X. Uh, OpenGL on OS X is still OpenGL because it's following the spec, um, just like OS X is Unix. All right, so uh, how is OpenGL different on OS X? Okay, OS X basically from its core is written on OpenGL. Um, all the graphics and pretty much everything you see on OS X from quite an early version, I'm not entirely sure specifically, is using OpenGL. It, everything's hardware accelerated um, and everything's optimized uh, using OpenGL. Uh, core animation is one of these technologies. Uh, core animation, moving everything around, uh, everything that core animation is using uh, as far as what it's outputting visually is using OpenGL. Um, and so by using this sort of, these sort of technologies, these Cocoa technologies, we can basically take advantage of the hardware on our computers. Okay, so in order to um, take advantage of this fully, you need to actually understand what OSX is doing. And that's pretty much interfacing with OpenGL. Um, so even though you might have all these fancy wrappers and you may have all these fancy classes to help you do things, underneath it all, they're actually using OpenGL. And so if you were hardcore enough, you could actually use all OpenGL directly. You don't need any of the OSX stuff, um, and it would be a lot more efficient, a lot faster. Um, but there are certain advantages in using Cocoa. And once again, OpenGL is an implementation, and my apostrophe is totally awful there. Okay, uh, so why not just use core animation instead of using OpenGL? I mean, sure, you want to have your massive multiplayer first-person shooter and why not just do it all with core animation? I mean, it's just a wrapper, isn't it? Okay, um, there's not only, uh, open, OpenGL's not only under core animation, it's also under a lot of other technologies. <coughs> and so you've got core image and core video also on top of OpenGL. Basically, all of these uh, OSX technologies are built on top of OpenGL. And by understanding this and un understanding how they all interact with each other, um, you can not only use the technologies on top, all of these core technologies, a lot more efficiently and a lot more, uh, well, efficiently pretty much, uh, and understand how they all fit together, but you can also um, go a lot more lower level and then use OpenGL in order to optimize, which is what today's talk is about. Uh, yeah, in addition, you've got all this massive array of technologies that you can play with. Okay, and then once again, on top of all of that, you've got the graphics hardware. So you've got these three layers of abstraction. You've got the uh, Cocoa classes up the top, or the core classes. Then you've got the OpenGL layer, and then underneath that, you've got the GPU. Now, one thing that you may be familiar with with uh, 
object orientation and then a lot of this abstraction is that with each layer that you add, there's a performance penalty. There's an overhead calling things, there's an overhead doing basically everything. And so as we add each one of these layers uh, and we add complexity, we're basically making it easier for ourselves to code, but a lot harder for ourselves to optimize. And so what I'm going to be talking about is how we can use OpenGL as an interface for this, uh, to the GPU in order to make what could potentially be cross-platform as well as highly optimized code. Okay, so let's get into optimization. Right, core animation. Core animation allows you to do uh, certain special effects, like as we saw there, move, uh, rotate, oh god, and scale. All right, all, this is uh, using Keynote, and every single one of those animations just there was in fact using core animation. Now all of these things can be enhanced and uh, supplemented by OpenGL, and because uh, OSX is using all of these technologies, it's a good thing to know about them and then know about all the abstraction layers between. Oh God, and all of this can be done in 3D. All right, so why not just use core animation and all of the core technologies instead of actually using OpenGL to make our game? Well, basically, we've got all these layers of abstraction. Do you want to have all of these different Cocoa classes on top? And then is that necessarily a good thing? Um, you have to keep in mind that the Apple engineers have highly optimized all of these classes, and then they're pretty much as good as they could be in a lot of ways for what they do. Although you actually have to use them as they're designed to be used. And so core animation is kind of like the worst example ever because it's really not designed to be used for a lot of the purposes of OpenGL. Um, all right, I'm not entirely sure what I meant there. Not standard. Hey, okay. Uh, you can't do complicated things in core animation. Um, if I wanted to do a full 3D game, doing that in core animation would be a real pain in the ass. Um, excuse my French. Um, basically, it's just not designed to scale to the sort of extent you'd need for the optimizations for a 3D game or data visualization for a scientific uh, research project. Um, if you're happy to have all of those performance penalties, then sure, I'll go for it, and I'd really love to see the output. Um, yeah, okay, so let's just go through a stupid example, which is basically where you could use core animation and all these core technologies in order to uh, do something. So this, here's how to create a truly hardware accelerated 3D model using the core technologies. And there's something from Quake, I think. Okay, so core animation uses basically what is called a sprite, which is, uh, to sum, a billboard, which is basically just a rectangular texture which you can move around and you can transform and rotate it and scale it and do all the usual things that you'd be able to do. Um, so it, it allows you to do various matrix transformations. And so while this is all good and it's good for a desktop application, if you wanted to do all of this sort of stuff in a 3D, 3D environment, it's not so good. So if we did want to make a 3D model in core animation, what we'd basically have to do is we'd have to create a rectangle, then we'd actually have to render that, uh, render a triangle onto that rectangle, and then we'd have to manipulate this rectangle in three dimensions in order to create the single triangle on our 3D model, which is kind of like the epitome of bad object orientation. We're trying to use an API how it's not meant to be used. We're trying to create a triangle or just a normal mesh operation using a uh, sprite which is just awful. Okay, so yeah, we can do the transforms in uh, 3D and then we can basically tile that all over our object, which is awful. And I was joking for that entire thing. I have a very dry sense of humor and I apologize. Okay, here's why that's awful. Each CA layer has its own texture, which means that you can have a lot of context switching and overhead um, on your graphics card. Each texture has its own contiguous rectangular block of memory, which means you can have a lot of wasted space around that triangle. If we just go back to that triangle, you see all of that red area there? That's basically wasted memory. And so pretty quickly, you're gonna run out of space on your graphics card. Uh, transitions, okay. Um, and so, and each layer has a significant calling overhead. So as you call uh, each operation on each core animation layer in order to manipulate and rotate it, you're doing uh, operations on uh, 16 uh, floating point values and you're doing that maybe 
uh, 30 or 40 times for each triangle, as opposed to if you pushed it all off into the GPU, you'd be doing a lot less and a lot faster. Okay, so that's kind of like the worst example ever of how you shouldn't use uh, core technologies and where you should be using OpenGL. Um, it's kind of just an example of where um, the worst case example, I guess. Okay. Yeah, basically don't do it. But if you actually did implement something like this and you made a full 3D model in core using core technologies, I'd actually like to see it because I think that would be quite a good laugh. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about performance. Uh, we're stepping up to Half-Life, I believe. Um, all right, th this scene here probably has about uh, 10,000 polys. Oh, no, here we go, 2,000. Okay, maybe one to 2,000 polygons. Um, if you tried to do this with the core technologies that I was saying before, you'd probably get something around maybe half a frame a second on my laptop, which is quite a good one. It's just not designed for it. And if you're trying to do something of quality like this, which is uh, this individual model itself is probably quite a lot of polygons, uh, probably about 2,000, although I think I say a bazillion. Yeah. This, this model here is probably a bazillion um, polygons. And if you're trying to do that with a similar technology that wasn't using the APIs correctly, then you just wouldn't even bother. It'd be like watching a slideshow. Okay, so why do you want OpenGL? All right, say uh, you, want to use, you want to create a game, you want data visualization, you want user interfaces, you want general purpose computing, or you want to activate your GPU's heated functionality. Okay, all these potential uh, possible uses for OpenGL. Uh, user interfaces, not necessarily, although uh, underlying, I think, a lot of the OSX interfaces are using OpenGL. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the OpenGL pipeline, which is basically uh, how information gets from the CPU to OpenGL and then to your screen. Okay. Right. Uh, it all basically ends up going through a display list. Whether that is on the CPU or on the GPU depends on both implementation and um, how you're actually trying to get it there. Uh, once it's gone through the disp display list, it goes through vertex processing, which basically means every single point in your model or in your world is processed and multiplied by the various matrices um, and then projected onto the view frustrum. And then you go through fragment processing, which basically means that every single pixel on your output is interpreted and updated or changed depending on how you're processing it. And then from there, it goes out to the frame buffer, which can then go back to the uh, CPU and then rendered onto the screen or directly to the, um, to the screen, depending on how you want to do it. Okay, so now we're gonna have a look at vertices, which are basically the components that make up each model. Uh, each vertice will have faces, and then these faces can be used to make up anything. Uh, you can use triangles, you can use quads, you can use all these various primitives that I talked about this morning in order to make up a complicated model. But the main concept here is that every single model you have is essentially going to be made up of vertices and faces. Uh, for example, this model, which is a more complicated one, which you could say is a dolphin, I guess. I think that's from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. All right. Uh, what I'm going to talk about now is immediate mode. Uh, immediate mode is quite, uh, it's probably the first thing you want to think about when you're trying to optimize OpenGL. Uh, what immediate mode basically means is that you're calling each vertice individually on your CPU, and then all of these things are immediately uh, shipping off to the GPU. And so what we've got here is GL vertex. The GL vertex family of functions is basically GL vertex 2F, 3D, 3F. Uh, it's a whole collection of functions which basically just puts a vertex or a point on the, to the GPU. And that's called between GL begin and GL end. And then in immediate mode, what that's basically doing is just shipping all of this off to the GPU. And then every time you do this, every time you transfer information from CPU to GPU, you've got this massive overhead, this bottleneck. Okay, so my fancy animation, that's moving the uh, data from CPU to GPU. And so what we're going to try and do is find out different ways to actually make this better. All right. Um, as you can see, the, uh, with one vertex, it's not necessarily going to be a problem. But as we create more and more vertices, uh, 
as, as you saw before, that model had 2,000 uh, polygons in it, which is going to be roughly 6,000 vertices, or probably less, depending on what sort of optimizations you do. You're going to have to transfer individually with all of these calls in immediate mode vertices from the CPU to the GPU. And then every single time you do this, you're going to have a C call. And so you're going to have the function call overhead as well as the data transfer overhead at every single one of these calls. And then not only this, but instead of just having vertices, you actually want to transfer normals and texture coordinates and a whole, have that whole heap of other per-vertex information uh, across the GPU. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a display list. And a display list is perhaps one of the first optimizations you can do. And what this basically allows you to do is collect all of those functions up into one massive list. And instead of having all of those C calls, uh, they're all called implicitly by OpenGL as efficiently as it, the implementation allows. And so we can go GL call list, and then it basically translates all of that on into data, and then it transfers that data on into the GPU's display list. And so now we've just basically optimized out all of those C calls and then just put it all in terms of data transferred. Now, another optimization for this is, is GL vertex pointer, where we can actually start with the data. And then what that will allow us to do uh, is basically transfer all of this information over to the GPU, and then we can use it directly on the GPU. Uh, actually, sorry. Uh, the GL vertex pointer actually works with an array of data uh, on the CPU rather than actually uh, having individual C calls. So it's not actually using a display list. OK. Uh, and then what we've got is geo buffer data, which is what I was accidentally talking about just then, uh, which is a similar concept where it actually has all of this data, transfers it to the GPU, and then instead of every frame actually transferring all that data across to the GPU again, it actually keeps it on the GPU and allows you to then reference it and then transfer it into the GPU's display list uh, with just one C call with no transfer of data. OK, power leveling. Not sure the relevance. I can't remember most of these. And an XKCD slide. Excellent. All right, types of buffers. Uh, there's three types of, or three main types of buffers. There's actually quite a few. Uh, there's the vertex buffer object, there's the frame buffer object, and the pixel buffer object. Uh, the vertex buffer object basically allows you to address vertices. Uh, that can also be uh, texture coordinates and normals and all that sort of stuff. All of these. Uh, vectors, essentially, on the GPU. Uh, so you can actually store all of this type of information on the GPU without actually having to transfer it backwards and forwards. The frame buffer object uh, is addressable fragments on the GPU, which basically just means that the output you get from your render, you can then address. And then you can use that again and manipulate it and change it. And then the pixel buffer object is basically being able to address a texture. And so you can treat all of these different things as something addressable from the CPU whereas it's actually stored on the GPU. And these are the three main OpenGL buffers. OK, so how do you actually manipulate the information once it's on the GPU? Sure, it's good to actually get all this information on the GPU, but what happens if you want some sort of dynamic information? What happens if you want dynamic data that you can change and modify later on? And so what we've got here is addressing those buffers. Uh, perhaps the simplest way to address the buffers, and perhaps the only way that I actually talk about today, is mapping. And when you map a buffer, what you essentially get is a pointer that you can then manipulate, and then you're actually addressing the uh, memory on the GPU itself. And so by going GL map buffer and GL unmap buffer, you can basically grab a pointer, and then the equivalent of releasing it in Coco to say, I don't want to talk, I don't want to use it anymore. I'm done with that memory. OK. So basically, all of that was uh, non persistent manipulation, which basically means that. Uh, any changes we make, the next frame, they're not going to be able to be used again, unless you actually call um, the map buffer functions every single frame. But then there's going to be this massive overhead uh, going from CPU to GPU. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is using uh, OpenGL shading languages and uh, to manipulate the vertex data on the GPU on the fly, which basically means that we don't have to have any transfer between CPU and GPU. We can just manipulate all of these buffers on the GPU without actually having to transfer information back and forth. OK, so in order to create a shader, what we have to do is uh, call GeoCreateShader. Um, 
then we have to call GL shader source and GL compile shader. What these three functions do, the first one uh, creates basically an ID or memory uh, in order to create a shader. The second one tells OpenGL where to get the shader from or basically gives it the source code as a C array. And the third one, compile shader, compiles it and if everything goes well, you'll actually have a working shader there. So how do you use it? Uh, once you've got your shader, then you call GL create program, um, then GL attach pro shader. Create program allows you to group um, shaders together. Uh, so if you have a vertex and a fragment shader, you can both put them in the same program. Um, a vertex shader manipulates vertices, which is fairly straightforward from the name, and a fragment shader uh, manipulates things like textures and what's actually going to be output onto the screen. And once you've added all of your shaders, then you link the program, much like you would when you actually compile in Xcode. You're compiling and linking. And then from there, you can actually use your shader uh, on your data. If you want, actually want to see all of the individual arguments and how to actually do all of this sort of stuff, I'm not sure if any of my slides cover it, but at the bottom, uh, there is a good example of how to do that. Um, you should be able to get that off the slides later on. And then, just like you would with a texture, when you actually bind a texture um, to be used, you go GL use program to say, I don't want to use the fixed functionality pipeline. I want to use my program instead. And so where we had that um, pipeline before, where it's had uh, vertex processing and fragment processing, uh, your shaders would be substituted in place. OK, so types of shaders we've got. The vertex shaders, which I mentioned before, uh, modify vertices. Fragment shaders uh, modify uh, fragments, which are the uh, texture components. And then the last type, which is quite new, is a geometry shader. And what a geometry shader allows you to do is actually create vertices uh, at runtime, or actually as the shader is running. And so you can pass vertices from your vertex shader into your fragment shader, and then create a whole heap of extra information that can then be passed on to your fragment shaders. And so you may wonder why you want to do this. Uh, once again, it's being able to create information dynamically. And so instead of having persistent information, um, well, instead of having data that never changes uh, on your GPU, you can actually modify it, you can create, you can basically do everything you could do on the CPU, but on the GPU. All right, so a vertex shader. I think we might get to see some code. Yay. Manipulate uh, perfect vertex data on the GPU. Well, I think I've just gone through all my slides. All right. Um, OK, this is a very simple example of a vertex shader. Uh, what it's doing is it's grabbing the position from OpenGL. So when we call GL vertex or we do it some other way, what it's doing is it's basically getting that vertex coordinate, which is this bit here, and then it's multiplying it by the current model view matrix. The model view matrix is basically uh, the translations, rotations, and all the other effects that you're doing to your object. Uh, then what this one's doing is just basically adding one to every component of the vector. Uh, GLSL, which is what this language is, uh, is quite fancy in that it allows you to work on multiple components or rearrange the components of your vectors and do all kinds of magic. Uh, so yeah, what that's doing is it's basically adding one to each component. So this is the equivalent of translating our object. And then uh, text chord, and uh, what the text chord does is it basically um, says to the next shader in the pipeline, I want my text coordinate to be here at this vertice, and then interpolate throughout uh, each vertice the texture coordinates for each fragment. And then dual position down the bottom just puts it into screen space. All right, so fragment uh, shaders. Fragment shaders, as I said, man uh, allow you to manipulate uh, per fragment data on the GPU. And so here, uh, we've got a uniform sampler my texture. Uh, what the uniform sampler is, it's basically just a reference to an image. And so when we say my coordinate uh, equals GL text chord 0 xy, that's the same texture coordinate that we had in the vertex shader before, although it's interpolated between each vertice for each fragment. And in most instances, in fact, for this, because we haven't specified otherwise, that'll actually interpolate uh, perspective correct, which basically means as it gets further away, you won't have uh, issues because of fine transformations. 
Um, and then here, my color, uh, basically is just doing a texture lookup uh, for that specific coordinate. And then geofrag chord uh, there is basically just outputting that color, multiply it by half, and then having alpha uh, value of one, which basically means I want it half as dark and I want it to be fully opaque. All right, you probably wouldn't want to use this fragment shader because it doesn't really do anything useful. It just makes everything darker. All right, and now the more interesting thing, geometry shaders, uh, basically allow you to extrapolate vertex data on the GPU. So you pass it a whole heap of vertices or a whole heap of other information, and then it will allow you to extrapolate and add information to that. For example, uh, one specific optimization that this can allow is that uh, basically for every vertex you have in your render, you're going to basically linearly increase the render time in most instances. And so if we have to transfer information or we have to change information on the, uh, on the CPU or on the GPU, then we're going to have this massive increase. But if we can actually do a lot of that work or ship a lot of that work onto the GPU or we can add data only as necessary, then we're going to have a massive uh, saving of time. And so what, the, uh, what this allows you to do is maybe work in screen space or work in some other, um, by some other means to actually add detail to your geometry or add information only as required. And so you can do various heuristics and various approaches to actually add information when you want it. All right, so this code here. Uh, once again, we've got our texture. And then what we're doing here is basically copying the one, um, we're basically copying the one object. So we've got all of our vertices. And then on this line here, we're moving all of those vertices to the right uh, by a half. That's if it's in the second loop iteration. So after all of this, what we're basically doing is we're having one copy. And then in the second loop iteration, we're making a second copy of all of our vertices. So if you were to output this on the screen, you'd basically have two copies of your object separated by half a unit. Uh, emit vertex basically says uh, to OpenGL, I want this vertex to be rendered. And then emit primitive, sure? Yeah. Um, there's the GL vertices here. Uh, represents the number of vertices in that particular primitive. So if it was a point, it would be one. If it was a triangle, it would be three. And then you can either use that directly or you can actually uh, pass in an argument or something to say, I want it to be working on. Yeah. Uh, to use, um, I think it's two. Yeah. Yeah, 2.0. Um, maybe 2.1, I've forgotten. Um, and then n primitive uh, basically says all of these vertices are all associated with the primitive that I'm currently working on. So if you were to do something like um, a triangle strip, for example, where certain properties or certain um, optimizations can be done depending on the order of the vertices, if you don't want that to apply to the second lot of vertices that you're outputting here, then you just call n primitive and then it'll start again and it won't actually associate the first and the second lot of vertices you're outputting. All right. So what we basically want to do in order to have persistent manipulation, manipulation that actually stays on the GPU between uh, flush calls or between actually rendering, uh, is be able to have old vertex data on the GPU and then be able to update new vertex data. So we want to actually be able to transfer information or actually update the vertices themselves on the GPU and actually have that persist, have that stay. And so what we need is a way to be able to get from a vertex buffer object to another vertex buffer object or transfer information or data between them. And so what we're going to do is uh, talk about uh, pixel buffer objects and fragment buffer objects. So what you can actually do is you can treat a vertex buffer object as a pixel buffer object and vice versa, which means that while previously we were actually rendering all of our information uh, to the screen, what we're going to do now is we're going to actually treat our texture as uh, vertices. And so instead of RGB on each component of your um, texture, you've actually got XYZ 
And so you can actually treat a texture as your entire model. And so that allows you to actually render uh, your vertices and then do fragment operations on each vertice in order to create your output. OK. And so now we've changed our pipeline. So we're, having, we're going from VBO, treating it as a PBO, then going FBO to VBO again. And uh, whilst you could have all of this all on the same VBO, you may uh, end up with collisions, or you may want your data to be dependent on other uh, texture coordinates or fragment coordinates. OK. This is um, basically the most primitive way, and it's probably the first way that people started to manipulate uh, the information on the GPU um, as far as uh, GP, GPU, or general purpose computing goes. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, so we want to be able to get from old vertex data to new vertex data. You can do the same thing with OpenCL. Uh, OpenCL will allow you to have a lot more kind of fluid manipulation of the information. It's designed a lot more for this sort of stuff. It's more a general purpose programming language than GLSL is. What I showed you previously is a bit of a hack. Uh, not necessarily, because it works quite well and it's platform independent and it's following the spec. But it's probably not the best way to do it as far as efficiency and uh, precision goes. A lot of the time with uh, coordinates, uh, with, with fragments, um, they're using single precision float, if not half precision float, which basically means you're going to lose precision really quickly. Um, whereas you can actually store textures as 16-bit, uh, I think, and even 32-bit, uh, which will give you a lot more precision, although there's also a time penalty there. OK. So also with uh, OpenCL, you have the advantage that you can go backwards and forwards. And so you don't necessarily have to have two vertex buffer objects, and the, the spec isn't undefined if you're moving between the same information. And so you don't actually have to copy all of your information across to a new buffer. You can actually work within the same buffer. And then that way, you don't have a performance overhead with all the copying. OK, if you want to know more about OpenCL, because it's not actually what this talk is about, meant to be about, you can go to chronos.org registry CL, uh, or you can have a look at this example here, which is quite useful, although quite primitive as well. Um, actually, there's a geometric displacement example um, on the browser web page as well. All right. Yeah. Oh, cool. So oh, excellent. <laughs> well, you could go to that as well. Um, if you have a look in the Xcode documentation for OpenCL, there's hundreds and hundreds of examples. By hundreds and hundreds, I mean about six. OK. Uh, yeah, the problem with doing a lot of this stuff onto the GPU and shipping it all to the GPU is that you can actually saturate the GPU, which means that your CPU is just kind of waiting for the GPU to do stuff. And then um, you end up basically uh, prematurely optimizing. Um, so suppose you need to balance the CPU and the GPU. How can you do this? Suppose you've done all of these other optimization techniques. What's left? How can you optimize? All right. Basically, in OpenGL, you want to minimize the number of state changes. OpenGL is state-based, which basically means uh, it, it's, it's kind of like the C way of object orientation in some ways, in that everything's abstracted away. You don't actually know about it. And then if you want to talk about a different object, you kind of say, I'm talking about this object now, and then all of the functions now refer to that. Um, and, but every single time you do that, there's this uh, switching overhead between the different states. And so when you change matrices or you change stacks, you're actually going to have to copy all this information, or you have to, on the GPU, you actually have to switch states between them. And so there's this massive state change overhead every single time you change a state, especially when you're using object orientation, like NS OpenGL context. NS OpenGL context is the wrapper class for the OpenGL context, which Whilst good and it does a lot of things for you, it actually has uh, this massive overhead with all the calls, especially because it's Objective C and so everything's going to be a message. Um, you can minimize implicit and ex explicit calls to this by um, uh, several techniques, basically calling it as minimum number of po times possible, uh, grouping all of your OpenGL calls together, and basically knowing what context you're in. Uh, you actually set it as the current context by calling uh, make current context, which is fairly straightforward. That's all in the uh, docs, which are at the bottom. Yay, docs. Um, 
Yeah, and in order to actually remove all of this calling overhead, you can use this macro, which is cgl macro.h. And then what this basically does is it allows you to set a uh, property in your class, which is uh, representing the underlying structure be below the context, the NS OpenGL context. And then every time you call an OpenGL call, it's actually using a defined statement within the header file to get around all this context switching. So it basically, if you set up your class correctly and you follow the procedure that's specified on that website, then it's going to get rid of a lot of the calling overhead by getting rid of all of this context switching. OK. Use threads. Uh, Grand Central Dispatch, um, which is new in Snow Leopard, um, will allow you to basically uh, remove the waiting for your GL calls to finish on the GPU, and you can basically do all your calculations. You can do all your vertex calculations that you may still need to do on your CPU before shipping them off to the GPU while your GPU is actually calculating what you did previously. Um, basically, have things chugging as much as possible. Uh, instead of GCD, you could use NS threads, which basically will allow you to create your own threads explicitly. Um, or alternatively, you could use NS operations, which basically allows you to put all of your different calls and all of your different operations within one kind of encapsulated thing and just chuck it off to happen. Uh, I think from Snow Leopard, uh, that is integrated into GCD, so it'll all be implicit. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with OpenGL is that it's not actually thread safe. And so you'll have to do locking and all that sort of stuff to ensure that your state isn't screwed with. Next. How exciting. All right. Um, if you really want to, you can use pthreads instead of all of these um, wrapped classes. And that'll basically give you a slight performance overhead if you tweak it enough. Uh, but as has been shown, um, Grand Central Dispatch and a lot of those underlying technologies can have quite similar performance uh, to what you'd see previously because you don't have the um, overhead of actually creating the threads and creating all the different memory and everything because it's already implicitly stored. Okay, yeah. You have to remember that OpenGL is not thread safe. And that's probably the biggest thing to come out of this. Um, so if you have all these kind of problems and it's crashing on you, it's probably because you're using multiple threads and you're not actually being thread safe. All right. Oh, also, minimize CPU interpretation. Uh, OpenGL on OSX uses GL floats internally. So if you're going to, um, unless you're actually explicitly specifying otherwise with uh, a buffer object or something, um, don't bother using some other f format. Don't use an integer or something for all your coordinates. Uh, use a GL float because anyway, regardless, it's going to have to trans. It's going to have to convert it on the CPU before it pushes it off to the GPU. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, all of those things. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Te texture data. I was saying as part of the buffers, they're all stored in the internal format you specify. Uh, yeah, there are some instances like that where you want to minimize the amount that you're actually transferring. Although, in that instance, you may have a performance penalty. Well, the entire point is that textures are big. You want to minimize the amount of data. Mm. Just... Not, not, not to mention you can also have compressed textures, depending on the extensions you're using. And in that instance, it's like this massive performance. Right. All, all I would... Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's with most of the calls, like as he was saying, with the geo color calls and a lot of the other vertex pointers and all that sort of stuff, they're all going to be using it internally yeah, on the seat. Yep. No. Sorry. Yep. Uh, that, that's implementation specific, and because I don't work for Apple, I don't know specifically. But um, from what I understand, 
depending on what point in the pipeline you're calling it, um, whether it's actually transferring that specific information or what you're actually storing in, in the other end. If you're calling it in uh, immediate mode, then it's going to probably transfer it as it is. If you store it into a buffer, then it's whatever format you specify for the buffer. And then it, in that instance, it's going to trans, it's gonna have to translate it into the appropriate representation before it transfers it over to the GPU. Yeah, so there would be some representation Yeah, which in most instances is GL. Yeah, M most of this presentation is, yeah, most of this implementation, uh, information is relevant to the desktop more than iPhone. Yeah. For example, you couldn't do GL Vertex on uh, iPhone 3G at all. <laughs> you have to use uh, vector pointers. All right. Uh, yeah, use display lists and other similar technologies to avoid OpenGL API calls. Uh, basically, as we are saying, you can get around a lot of the um, calls by using display lists. Um, and OpenGL is state-based, and a lot of things are dependent on that state. So minimizing the number of state changes, the number of pushing and popping of matrices, and basically anything that changes the internal state of OpenGL and switches things around, minimizing all of that um, and grouping all of those things together. So if you're going to have to work on similar matrices, uh, or you're going to have to work on specific uh, a hierarchy of matrices, then try and <coughs> minimize the number of pop and push calls by grouping things together in order to minimize the state changes. All right, so Mac OS X tools. Uh, Mac OS X has several tools that are quite useful for optimization and uh, basically viewing of all of your shaders and uh, your open gel calls and that sort of thing. Uh, Shader Builder is the first of these that I'm going to talk about. Uh, what Shader Builder basically allows you to do is load various shaders and then view them. Uh, in the Render tab, uh, actually, I'll just talk about this tab a bit more. Uh, you've got three shaders here. There's a vertex shader, a geometry shader, and a fragment shader. They're in that order because that's the order they go through the pipeline. So each one of these is written in GLSL, which is the shader language I referred to previously. and then. Uh, what it basically does is you feed it a whole heap of vertices with a certain type. Um, actually, as we see here, triangle strip and triangles, that was your initial question, how it knows what it's talking about. And so in this instance, it's talking about triangle uh, strips. And it also knows that it's outputting 512 vertices maximum in addition to what it had previously, which I assume is an implementation-specific thing to optimize the um, contiguous memory. Okay, so the render output, this is very boring, but this is the sort of thing you'll see. It tells you what sort of graphics card you have. It shows you the output, and it can tell you what color is under the cursor at the point. Uh, down there where it says torus, you can change that to a uh, different type of geometry. Uh, so you can have it a plane, you can have it a uh, cube, I think. You can have various different types of uh, geometry, and that'll basically allow you to uh, test your uh, shaders on different um, different makeup of geometry. For example, you may have normals that are always uh, perpendicular to the plane, or you may have normals that wrap around the surface, or various other things. One of them is the teapot, which is quite famous, and that uh, is basically a good test model for making sure that your shaders work in a lot of different environments. Okay, and then benchmark there, which is quite relevant, uh, will allow you to basically see how long this takes uh, for a certain number of frames. Okay, then the textures tab will basically allow you to specify the textures. Uh, here we've got a diffuse map, a height map, and a normal map. And basically each one of these can be uh, combined together to create a uh, complex uh, output. Um, in this instance, it'll allow you to uh, light that uh, with a per, per vertex uh, relief map, which is what this shader was doing, I believe, which basically just means that we're adding extra information to our geometry in screen space, which is a certain optimization, which is very good for having information or geometry in the background as well as in the foreground, and then it only actually uh, calculates what's on screen. 
which is quite similar to the level of detail thing that I was talking about and you were talking about, which is adding geometry, depending on what's needed. So things that are far away, you wouldn't have much geometry, and as things got closer, you could actually use the depth components of each vertex in order to determine how much extra geometry you want to add to the model. And then the last part, which is symbols, basically uh, just allows you to refer to the uniform uh, variables of each one of those shaders, which basically says, uh, I've got three textures and I'm going to put these, uh, I'm going to reference each one of these textures by these names. Okay, the next thing I'm going to have a look at is instruments. Instruments is quite useful for a myriad of things. Uh, uh, it can allow you to optimize multiple things across multiple threads, and slowly it's integrating all of these low-level tools into this nice visual environment. Um, so here, it allows us to add an instrument for the OpenGL driver, which basically allows us to specify individual OpenGL uh, statistics, uh, like the number of calls, the number of... Uh, things being passed to and from the GPU, all that sort of stuff. It basically, anything that the driver knows about, you can talk to he here and actually get it graphed out. And then through that, you can optimize so you can see how, how often your CPU is working, how often your GPU is working, and then ensure that you're actually using both things as much as possible. Okay, so this is the sort of stuff that you can put on and off and yeah. All right, the next thing is the OpenGL profiler, um, which is, I think you can actually get to it through instruments now, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's a similar idea in that you can actually specify an application, run an application, run certain profiling uh, on it, and then through that you can actually see which calls are being made when, when the halts are, all that sort of stuff. And this is the sort of information you get out. You can actually get individual calls, as in you know how often a certain call is called. Say, bind texture here is called 2.2 thousand times, which is quite a lot. GL disable, GL end, basically everything that you'd have in OpenGL, you can actually see how often it's called. Um, I don't believe so. Yeah. It may, but I haven't actually seen it. I imagine there'd be too much overhead to actually work out what's redundant. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. I appear to be finished. Any questions? Yes.